Star Salak with Android Authority reporting live from CS 2016. It's been a long day, my voice is a little bit blown out, and I'm here with a very respected colleague of mine, Mr. Bill Plummer, who's VP of Strategic External Affairs for Huawei. Thank you for your time today, sir, for meeting yep. with me. Thank you. Yeah. So let's talk about 2015 for Huawei. Not a bad year. Not a bad year. Um, now, we've not, we've not yet reported officially our revenues, but we're talking about 60 billion, um, okay, well. which is a slight jump from last year's 46 billion. Um, if you look at just the consumer segment of the, the 60 billion, we hit in terms of consumer revenues last year about $20 billion, which is a 70% increase over the previous Impressive. year, which is really, really remarkable. Mm. 108 million smartphones shipped last year, which is a 44% increase over the previous year. So, yeah, it was a nice year. That's a good Very year. Very good year. And is that including Honor, or is that just that Huawei? That does include Honor. That does include that Honor, does include okay. Honor. And in terms of the competitive landscape, in terms of you know, what consumers perceive various brands to be in the space, who would you say are your closest competitors in 2015? Well, I mean, we're in, 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 depending on the market, obviously, yeah. as, as, a, as a March and through the year, we were the number one smartphone vendor in China. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, in Europe, we're number three. Mm -hmm. uh, Latin America, we shipped 12 million Not bad. Uh, devices last year, also roughly number three. So it's you know Samsung, Apple, Huawei, mm -hmm. and and you know the rest cascade down from there. I see. Yeah, definitely. Well. Looking at 2016, now you guys have penetrated into the U.S. market with the launch of the Honor 5X. Uh, it's going to be it's on Amazon right now for pre-order, price of 199. What other kind of devices do you think are going to come to the U.S. in the future? Well, we yeah, obviously we brought the Nexus the, yeah. the device this year, um, which has done really rather well. I mean, it sold out in the first month. Yeah. Google Store just sold out. It's an incredible um, device. Yeah, it is. I have a few here. You got um, one? Yeah. Uh, not giving them out yeah. just, just at the moment, no. but <laughs> I'm sure you have one. I do, yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, we've done actually, we've done remarkably well with the P8 Lite. Yeah. Um, and again, this is all through you know, big box retail and, yeah. and, and e-channel. Um, you will see more Honor devices coming here. Uh, you will see a broader range of Huawei branded devices coming here. And it's sort of a complementary approach. Um, just as the approach to the U.S. market is similarly complementary in terms of from a channel perspective, um, the U.S. market is different. Um, it has, you know, the, the carrier channel is yeah. far more pronounced here than anywhere else. Yeah. And so we're taking a complementary approach, working with the carriers to fill their portfolios, but then also addressing the consumer segments that are going to buy unlocked anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where some of the Huawei devices and all of the Honor devices are targeted. So talking about the Nexus 6P, I mean, that was a, a breakthrough for Huawei in a lot of people's eyes. How was it architected and how was it achieved? And can you talk about any potential for future collaboration with Google? Well, I mean, it, 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 when, you're, when you're involved with Google on a Nexus project, you're, you know, it is a special project within yeah. your organization. And so you know, Huawei, of course, the consumer business continued to move along um, while this project moved along. So it's very collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in terms of the, the inter, in, inter, uh, interaction between Huawei and Google, um, it is not an initiative of either company. It is truly a joint initiative. Mm -hmm. um, I think we enjoyed the experience. I believe that Google enjoyed the experience. Um, and I think that both sides would look forward to enjoying the experience again. Absolutely. Well, consumers absolutely love the device. And it got our Editor's Choice Award. And it was second place in our best of Android. Oh, that's unfortunate. Uh, but it was the reader's choice. It was what the readers wanted to win. Okay. And Anyway, it's just a fantastic device, so we really have to congratulate you for that. Well, I'm carrying one now, and I'm also carrying a Mate 8 now, and the I also 8. have a P8 on me now, so no. I'm carrying three phones, which is probably too many. <laughs> a little um, bit. I look, though, at, I, I'm, I'm torn between the Nexus and the Mate 8, yeah. and I think that the winner ends up, the Mate 8 is just... It's, 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 ex such it's exquisite. An, such an elegant it's a, device. It really is, yeah. Maybe, from my personal preference, a tad bit too large, but I've, we yeah. talked about this a, a year or two ago where we I, I've got this phablet phobia. Yeah, I know you do. I, it's, it's, it was a Media Pad X2 that we oh, were talking no, no, about. No, no, I, I mean, it's big, but it's beautiful. It is. It's yeah. gorgeous. It's gorgeous. So what kind of challenges does Huawei face in 2016? Um, well, I think, as I mean, industry-wide, we're, we're, we're moving towards, you know, as you wander around here at this show and, and everyone's talking about wearables or other connected devices or connected solutions or what have you. And, and, and that's great. 
Mm. And this is the, you know, the so-called interweb of stuff or what I, mean, I, <laughs> I hate IoT as a phrase. But, I do too. <laughs> but it is what it is. So it we'll, is we'll call it IOS or IWOS, interweb of stuff. Um, and you can replace the stuff with an S word of your choice. Um, but, <laughs> but that's all exciting and that's all very sexy, but how is all that going to work? Yes. So from a consumer perspective, Huawei obviously is, we're in the wearables business. Um, we're doing terribly well in the modules business, working mm -hmm. with particularly the German automobile manufacturers, yeah. taking an approach there where it's like, look, we don't, we don't know the vehicular environment. You, you guys figure out the user interface. We make radios. We make yeah. damn good radios. Yeah, you do. And so, <laughs> you know, so that's a, that's a big business for us as well. Mm -hmm. And then populating a range of devices that gives, you know, a variety of consumer segments. We're not a one trick pony like some, no. of some the folks in our competitors. Yeah. Base. Um, but then there is that infrastructure business and all the Which magic. Which is massive. Yeah. Yeah. And all the magic of wearables and all the magic of the interweb of stuff is only going to work if you got the networks to support it. You need that infrastructure. And and you know, if imagine, you know, 2G or, or imagine 3G as as a little stream through the forest and 4G is the river fed by the stream. Well, 5G is going to have to be the ocean. So it's the ocean. Has to be. Yeah. You're right. Because otherwise, you know, we we've, we've already said 100 billion connections plus by 2025. Yeah. At 10 gig a second, bare minimum, and with sub microsecond latency, because some of those connections might be telemedicine related. Yeah, exactly. And you kind of, you know, a you delay, not a good thing. You need it. And, and in a smart car environment, the yeah. same thing. Building out those networks is going to be critically important, and we are already $600 million invested in R&D for 5G, a network technology that won't be deployed for half a decade. Mm -hmm. um, setting, the, uh, building that understanding this year as we continue to build our consumer brand but help the industry also understand we need to work together. Getting to 100 billion connections is going to be a collaborative effort. Doesn't uh, seem like the industry is prepared to be honest. Particularly markets like the US where it seems to be quite a bit slower in terms of adopting the latest generation technology. It'll be, I, I think that, well, the U.S. actually, in, in terms of LTE, you know, the U.S. was definitely behind in 3G. The U.S. actually led, to some extent, 4G deployment, largely because they were so far behind in 3G. Yeah. Um, and also because the Europeans bankrupted themselves in buying Spectrum for 3G. It, it's, <laughs> and you know, China also a leader in, in LTE or 4G yeah. deployment. Um, it's, it's, it, between now and five years from now, the things that we will be doing, the, the devices and the solutions that will be connected, and, and the, the graduation, you and I will carry a smartphone mm -hmm. five, 10 years from now. Yes, but at some will. point along the way. It's going to go away. It's, there's going to be a wearable here, or a wearable in your clothes, or, or, or some solution that's in your smart car or your smart home. And so that evolution is one we all need to be preparing for as it well. It will be profound. And something that Huawei, as you know, as the world leader in infrastructure, and as a, a, a top three soon, well, as aspiring to be top two in terms of devices solution, we think it's important to be driving this conversation and looking forward. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a responsibility as as an innovative leader to be a part of the conversation. And you know, that does bring you know a very logical next question, which is. You know, Huawei was demonized, you know, unfairly or fairly, depending on your perspective. Well, um, my perspective is clear. Yeah, so your perspective is very clear. <laughs> but I mean, the United States clearly has, you know, some kind of disdain for Huawei's technology. Um, but yet, Huawei still produces, as you say, the world's leading, you know, 5G solutions that are coming down the pipe. And you guys are selling billions of dollars of equipment to carriers around the world annually. Yeah. So, is that going to inhibit or hurt the United States technological progress if they're unwilling to play ball, so to speak? That was then, this is now. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there was, you know, uh, Huawei was a victim of some unfortunate collateral damage in the US-China geopolitical relationship a few years ago. Yes. Um, and since then, as a result of a number of certain revelations, um, like Prism? It, it, it has driven a better understanding, including with policymakers, of the nature of this industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, whether you're a Huawei or a Cisco or, or, or an Ericsson. Siemens. And, and, and those concerns, by the way, didn't apply to consumer. They only applied to network. Yeah. You know, we're all global companies. We're all interdependent. We're all intertwined. We're all relying on common supply chains. And I think the understanding that exists today, including among 
and political minded, um, is much more mature than it was then. Mm. And, and knowing that, look, to the extent that there are vulnerabilities, they're universal. Yes. And so let's find you know reasonable, rational, and commercially logical ways to address them. And particularly with with you know the need to extend broadband today and prepare for for whatever tomorrow's broadband is, ensure competition in the marketplace. And with you know Nokia and Alcatel coming together, it, the imperative is even stronger for American carriers, for instance, to make it clear they when they get ready for 5G. They want they want a competitive space. They need yes, to they, do. they need to pit the competitors against one another yeah. to drive down the cost. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll take your network widget and your network what's it, and since they're interoperable and built to the same standard, I'm going to put those together. So you guys got to bid yourselves yeah. and compete on quality, compete on price, compete on technology, and compete on security assurance. That's, that's where we'll be. That's extremely well said. Thank you. And, okay. and that's exactly why I brought you here because you're <laughs> an extremely erudite man. So, winners, losers, 2016, any, any predictions looking at a crystal ball? Do you think things are going to be more of the same? Are our heads going to roll? Are you Nokia going to make a comeback? Oh, I Is, thought we were talking about the election. Well, no. Um, oh, yeah, woo. okay. Who's going to win? Oh, God. Um, I can't. I, <laughs> two careers ago, I was a diplomat, and as a yes. diplomat, I was not allowed to actually have a, or at least not publicly have any political ah, affiliation or uh, uh, preferences. And, and I've done a good job of, since then, not telegraphing any preferences. Yeah. Um, this is one of the weirdest yes. <laughs> campaigns I've ever seen. Um, I'm, I'm firmly hoping that America <laughs> remains a marginally rational country in the future. Doesn't seem like it will, though. No, I think we will. I think I we just so. need to get this out of our system. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're working through that. Yes, we are. Um, and it's kind of like Southern Oregon is no longer part of the United States, apparently. Well, um, I didn't know that. Well, we'll fix that. OK. Uh, it'll work itself out. Well, Canada's um, not a real country either, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but the the in the industry, I think it's going to. I mean, the the evolution of smartphones is going to continue to 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 be fast paced. I mean, the the cadence of that industry right now and wearables yes. is so much faster than than most it's other IT the sectors. Yeah. Um, I don't see that changing. Um, there are no you know huge big infrastructure deals going on really anywhere. Everyone is you know building out 4G and and, and you know getting the you know where there are capacity issues. You got microcells and picocells or yeah. coverage issues or or even as Huawei is doing here in the U.S. and you know some of the rural areas in eastern Washington, eastern Oregon. Mm -hmm. We've deployed gigabit city solutions for places where the major carriers just simply weren't there. Yeah, I heard that. Um, so those you know it's, it, I think it'll it'll be more of the same this year. Um, Kind of like the evolution of the show year to year. Um, it's only the first day, and I've been around. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I'm waiting still. There's always at some point. There's always an aha or a, yeah. a, a gotcha or a always. wow. I haven't haven't seen it yet. I don't know. I haven't seen it either. It's my fifth time doing it, but I know there will be something significant. Well, once we're off camera, I'm going to tell you about something I heard about, but <laughs> okay. I'm not going to say it on camera. Uh, we'll have to stay tuned for that. Yes, Mr. Plummer. A real pleasure and honor. Thank you. Guys, Darcy Lacouve from CS 2016 reporting, signing off.